Hi, I'm Neil Worthen with the Rural Community Assistance Partnership and we're here at the wastewater treatment plant serving the city of Santa Fe, New Mexico and today we're going to be talking about emergency preparedness. More specifically, what you can do to be ready for an emergency. Emergencies at wastewater treatment plants come in all shapes and sizes, most of them unexpected. Think about where you are, think about emergencies that have happened to you, emergencies that could happen to you, your infrastructure and above all, public health. My name is Luis Orozco. I'm the plant superintendent here for the wastewater management division. Uh, I got a call from the supervisor on call here and she told me that the West Digester had blown a seal. It could have exploded. When you have oxygen and methane, that causes a very explosive reaction. And we were concerned about that. As long as the methane was coming out of the tank, we were okay. We just didn't want oxygen going in where the methane was and causing an explosion. I would say we have to prepare for that and, and know what to do. Okay, and then stop, think of what you guys just did and say, okay, what can we do different? So when it does happen, you may have taken out of the kinks that, you know what, I shouldn't have done that. You know, I should have done this instead. Why have an emergency and disaster response plan? First and foremost, we're in the business of protecting public health. We can't violate the public's trust. Wastewater treatment plants can be inherently hazardous places. We're in the business of protecting the environment. This is an essential public service that must go on rain or shine 24 seven. Secondly, we want to be able to minimize the potential damages to public infrastructure. Wastewater treatment plants are expensive to build and expensive to maintain. Thirdly, Failure to respond adequately to an emergency or a disaster can expose an agency to potential litigation for failure to properly respond. Fourthly, to minimize negative public relations. Many of us saw in the wake of Hurricane Katrina and other natural disasters that failure to adequately respond and failure to adequately mitigate the damages and the effects of a disaster can lead to a public relations nightmare. One of the most important parts of an effective emergency and disaster response plan is having effective mutual aid agreements in place before disaster strikes for critical supplies and equipment for things like fuel deliveries, personnel, food, and housing for first responders. That's usually accomplished through an entity called WARN, which stands for the Water and Wastewater Agency Response Network and that is utilities large and small, neighbor helping neighbor, coming together, establishing what's called an omnibus mutual aid agreement so that they can agree to come to each other's aid in the event disaster strikes. For example, in terms of mutual aid agreements, the city of Santa Fe has mutual aid agreements in place for delivery of fuel that would power all the emergency generators that would run the facility in the event of a regional power outage. Another critical element of plant security, emergency and disaster response, uh, having good well-maintained fencing, barbed wire, locks on the gates, adequate lighting, making sure that vegetation is cleared from the fence, making sure that the fences are inspected on a regular basis, routine patrols so that people on the outside of the fence are seeing personnel and equipment moving around inside the facility. Wastewater treatment plants have now been designated as critical infrastructure. The idea is to keep people and animals who don't belong in the facility out of the facility. Like many wastewater treatment facilities, this one uses chlorine gas as a primary disinfectant. Chlorine gas can be very hazardous if it's misused or gets out of control or escapes from a cylinder due to a leak or any other means. On the floor behind me is a small leak detector sensor that is connected to an alarm system that can alert the operators or any other personnel in the event that a leak occurs in this building. Over here in this box, as there should be in every chlorine storage facility, is a leak repair kit. In this box are all the tools and all the equipment that might be needed to repair almost any kind of a leak or failure that could happen with this cylinder. So what is the risk with a large quantity of compressed chlorine gas in a facility like this? 
The risk would be if there was an uncontrollable leak or an unrepairable leak and this large cylinder were to completely empty in an uncontrolled way, that would constitute an emergency or a disaster. Inside this cabinet, like two or three other locations within this facility, self-contained breathing apparatus or SCBA which is ready on a moment's notice, filled with fresh compressed air, inspected every six months. The operator will need to find this in a hurry, put it on properly to enter the chlorine room or any other area where chlorine gas is leaking. So how do we start actually getting prepared for an emergency or a disaster? First and foremost, draft that emergency response plan. There are excellent free templates available on most state and primacy websites. There's an excellent free template available on the Rural Community Assistance Partnership website. A second step, get your board or your decision makers or your city council to buy into that plan and adopt it formally. Make sure it's part of your standard operations procedures. Under federal law, vulnerability assessments and emergency response plans are required for any community serving a population greater than 3,300. Third step, train your operations and maintenance personnel to carry out the plan, to know exactly where all of the spare chemicals and spare equipment are, how to implement the mutual aid agreements. Fourth is to establish those mutual aid agreements. Fifth step, designate tasks. Figure out who is going to do what, have it all written in a narrative form in your ERP, which personnel are going to respond on which staff, on which shift, depending on when the disaster hits. Establish an emergency operations center, which is typically away from the area where the hazards might exist, maybe next to public safety or a sheriff's office where they have radio communications equipment. Finally, practice the plan. Stage mock disasters in partnership with other public safety agencies like fire protection, county sheriff, police departments, and stage mock disasters where the response plan has to actually be carried out in real time. We've been talking about disaster preparedness, being ready before a disaster strikes, but EPA and other regulatory agencies are focused equally on disaster resilience. It's more of a mindset. It's not just being ready for a disaster before it happens, but maintaining public safety, public health, and regulatory compliance during the disaster, after the disaster, getting back to normal as quickly as possible, and being ready for the next one if and when it does happen. The effluent leaving this facility meets the highest standards of quality required by EPA and public regulatory agencies. The job of the treatment plant operator is to make sure this facility runs this way 24 hours a day, seven days a week, regardless of any disaster or emergency that might occur. It's not just the job of the operator, but also the public officials who oversee these treatment plants. The way that we can make sure that happens, not violate the public trust that is placed in us for protecting the environment and treating wastewater, is to have an effective emergency and disaster response plan, practice that plan, and make sure that it works. For Rural Community Assistance Partnership, I'm Neil Worthen.